Chapter 3. A Gift. Year of 1824. Get up, the familiar voice of the maid called. It was the early fifth hour. Felix continued snoring, trying to catch up on much-needed slumber. The maid called again, this time more sternly. Wake up, you'll be late. In a sudden burst of energy, he scrambled out of bed. An open book sitting on his chest fell to the floor as he got up. He picked it up in haste, skimming the pages to find his place. The book was the Shakespeare play, Romeo and Juliet. You fell asleep late, reading again, didn't you? The maid scowled. She walked to the nightstand that had a fully melted candle. The entire thing had been covered in hardened wax. She began to counsel. You do realize that candles cost money. This is the third time this week you've wasted them. Your father wasn't happy last week when we had to order extra. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. I've almost finished the book. I know very well that both you and Fanny have read that book many times. She referred to their shared love of Shakespeare. From now on, I'll be sure that you aren't staying up late. Your mother was frustrated after I told her how hard it was to wake you up. For goodness sake, you are fifteen now. Learn some responsibility. Felix sighed and went back to pick an outfit for the day. Today deemed important, so he chose his most modest linen and wool garments. An important figure in music had taken up residence in Berlin during a tour. A composer and performer by the name of Ignaz Mocheles. Leia sent him an invitation to have dinner with him that day. It was Felix's hope that Ignaz would give him some, some music lessons upon his short stay. Felix was ready for the day by six. He grabbed his general book of study and trudged to the dining table. His siblings were already into their books. Leia warned upon his entrance. Today is very important, as you know. It is a must to be on time on such days, referring to his tardiness. Felix silently opened his book of grammar studies. The afternoon consisted of music and theory studies. Selter had given him some counterpoint studies and wanted him to incorporate them into composition. It kept Felix busy for an hour or so. Fanny joined him after finishing some needle work with Leia. After they composed some, they read some books. No letters from Mr. Mochella's arrived. Felix felt a wave of disappointment as the hour of dinner came. The family sat together at the table, with a nice meal consisting of roasted lamb and duck. It had been made nicer than usual since they had been expecting a guest. The family felt disappointment at Ignaz's absence. Abraham tried to brighten the mood. Well, at least it's nice to have a fancier family dinner every now and again. Leia and the children nodded. The food was quite savory and satisfying. After dinner was eaten and cleaned up, Leia decided to write to Ignaz again. She went to the stationary desk in the drawing room and penned. Berlin, November 18th, 1824. We much regretted not seeing you at dinner today. Pray, let us have the pleasure of your company, if not earlier, at least next Sunday. Have you kindly thought over our requests concerning lessons? You would sincerely oblige us by consenting. If you could do so without interfering with arrangements you have made for your stay in this place. Please do not set down these repeated requests to indiscretion, but attribute them solely to the wish that our children should be enabled to profit by the presence of the princess pianist. With your sincere regards, Leia Mendelssohn Bartholdi. She folded up the letter and straightway had it sent. Hopefully the letters were actually getting to him. On the other hand, he probably had a lot to do on his limited stay in the city before moving on to the next. It was a few days later when a letter of reply came. Ignaz agreed to meet Felix, but gave sparse meeting arrangements. Felix felt inclined to go to Ignaz's house right away. Leia prevented him in the moment of his excitement and went to the writing desk. Berlin, November 23rd, 1824. Being uncertain whether my son will find you at home, I write this line to ask if you feel inclined to visit the Sing Academy. Felix, at any rate, will call for you, as his way lies in that direction. If you are disengaged, will you join our family dinner at three o'clock? Or, should that be impossible, will you accompany Felix after the Academy? It lasts from five to seven o'clock, and be one of our small circle at tea. If I may be allowed to renew my repeated requests that you will give lessons to my two eldest children, be so good enough to let me know your terms. I should like them to begin at once, that they may profit as much as possible during the time of your stay here. With sincere regards and esteem, yours, Leah Mendelssohn Bartholdi. 
She handed the letter to the servant and instructed, This is to arrive to at Mr. Mochelis. He must get it, as it is important. Now go, Schnell. The servant left in a hurry. Leia turned to Felix. I'll have you go over to his residence in an hour. The letter would have reached him by then. I ask that he accompany you to the academy. If he can't be at dinner, then here for tea. Hopefully he offers lessons. Be sure to hold that conversation when brought up. Felix nodded. In the meantime, he decided to go to the music room with Fanny to show her a piece he'd begun to write. It was a sonata that had made much progress over the week since he had started it. He always felt inclined to ask Fanny for approval of his work. She had more experience in composition. Felix listened closely to her opinions. After correcting and adding notes and phrases, the hour went by. Felix packed up his compositions and clavier music. He grabbed the letter of Ignaz that contained his address. Leia headed out the door with him and stopped a carriage driving by. She told Felix, Remember to persuade him to give Fanny lessons as well. I will, Felix climbed in the chase. The carriage drove on across the city to the address written on a note he handed the coachman. At precisely noon, he arrived outside the complex in which Mochelles was staying. A servant from the complex came and escorted him in by the request of Ignaz. When Felix entered the flat, he was welcomed by Ignaz, who was at the piano in the main room. His piano took up most of the space due to the small size of the flat. Ignaz Mochelles was originally from Bohemia, born in Prague in 1794. His father played guitar and had determination for one of his children to become a musician. His sister seemed to be eager, but ended up quitting piano lessons, leaving them to Ignaz. Soon after his father's death, he moved to Vienna, where he gained much musical influence. His instructors included Johann Alprechtberger for theory and Antonio Salieri for composition. Ignaz, now in his thirties, had a successful career as a composer and pianist. His current home base was in London, England, where he had a wife by the name of Charlotte. He gestured Felix to sit at the piano with him. He had a piece of music already out, a duet. He asked, can you read this with me? Yeah, Felix placed his fingers on the keys of the lower voice of the duet. Ignaz smiled and places at the upper melody. They began playing after counting in. The piece was quite beautiful, one Felix had not heard before. After playing it, Ignaz said in an impressed tone, that was perfect on at the spot. You read as well as any professional. Danke, but may I ask, who is the composer of this piece? I have not heard it before. It is an obscure piano work by the composer by the name of Schubert. I know not much of him. I picked up this piece from a supposed friend of his on my travels through Vienna. It was a painter I liked and bought a painting. He then begged me to play and keep this duet written by a friend of his. It is quite beautiful. It is strange how some of the most beautiful things render their creator unknown. Maybe someday we'll hear of him, Felix mentioned. Right. Anyways, what did you bring along with you? He pointed at the small stack of music. Felix showed him his favorite pieces. He brought a Beethoven piece to see if Ignaz would enjoy it. To his surprise, he let Felix play an entire sonata. Ignaz asked, You like Beethoven? Yeah, his music has so much to it. I don't get to play it as often as my teacher doesn't care for the intensity. I had teachers like that. When I was ten, I had the chance to hear Beethoven's eighth sonata. I wanted so badly to play it. At the time, I couldn't afford sheet music, but I happened upon the pages at the library and copied it for myself. My teacher rebuked the playing of such music. When I became serious in my career and studied at the conservatory in Prague, my instructor mostly wanted me to play Mozart, Bach, and Clementi. I enjoyed my time at the conservatory still but everything was made up for it when I got to work with Beethoven in Vienna. Felix's eyes widened. You worked for Beethoven? Yes, he commissioned me to prepare the piano score for his opera. It was tough work, but we were in good company. He's not as chaotic as many make him out to be. He is a little, but not terrible, Ignaz smiled. Felix looked at him in astonishment. He couldn't believe that Ignaz had not only met Beethoven, but worked for him. Ignaz then changed the subject and grabbed a manuscript from Felix's pile of music. It was a composition. Felix played it for him, as well as some others. Ignaz asked Felix quite a few questions on how he composed. Felix gladly explained and asked Ignaz questions as well. After visiting and playing the piano for a few hours, Ignaz mentioned, I do believe the time is nearing four already. We've missed your family's dinner, and aren't you to be at the academy by five? Yes, my mother wishes you to escort me and come to tea at my house afterwards. 
Tea, that sounds quite English. I'm very fond of England. I chose to reside there with my wife, Charlotte. Have you been to Britain? No, but I'd love to someday. But I must inquire. If you would be in favor of giving my sister and I lessons, our mother and father insist. Does your sister play as well as you? Ignaz questioned. Felix gave a firm reply. She is a better keyboardist than I. She composes as well. Ignaz nodded in intriguement. He then said, I shall teach with what time I have. Now let's get to the academy. They rode a carriage to the academy. It was a bit early, but Zelter was there as usual. Ignaz was glad upon meeting him. They happened to speak much on the subjects of Bach. Felix had some interest in the conversation, but it wasn't anything new to him. Zelter always spoke much about Bach's music. Ignaz found much interest as he had only come across pieces of Bach through his time at the conservatory. Selter smiled upon hearing this. I have a large collection of Bach's manuscripts in my office. Would you like to see? I'd be obliged, Ignaz answered. Felix lifted his head from boredom. Selter never offered to show anyone this collection. Felix had only heard of it, but never got to see it. He went to follow, but Selter turned to him. Felix, can you go make sure that the auditorium is ready for rehearsals? I'd like to stay in company with Ignaz. Felix knew his teacher did not want him to go with. Selter pressured. Everyone will be showing up for rehearsal soon. I want everything set. He tried to sound nice in front of Ignaz. Felix gave him a dead stare, knowing he wasn't meaning to be kind. Ignaz suggested, I think Felix should stay in company. I think his mother wanted him to stay with me, as my visit here is limited. All right, my office is this way. Selter headed down a corridor. They stopped at a room. Zelter unlocked it, and they went in. He went straight to the large oak cabinet that lined the back wall of the large office. It had many openings to store things on the shelves. Each one was crammed full of books, of scores, and papers. Zelter gladly let Ignaz get a glimpse of the many Bach manuscripts. Felix had not known he kept so many. Abraham had collected a good amount of Bach's manuscripts at an auction before fleeing Hamburg. Zelter made sure some of his father's collection resided with the academy. Now that Felix saw the hundreds of sheets crowded in one large cabinet, he felt that Zelter was rather hoarding them than collecting them. As Zelter allowed Ignaz to skim through the music, Felix glanced at his instructor in confusion. He never let anyone near his precious Bach collection. As Ignaz held some to study, Felix tried to get a glimpse. Zelter grabbed them before Felix could hold them. He even went so far as shooing him away if he leaned too close. He didn't want Felix near them. Ignaz was far too awestruck to notice the silent quarrel between Felix and Zelter. After Ignaz looked at many of them, there was one he especially was fond of. Zelter looked at it and exclaimed, That's a very good keyboard work. That happens to be a copy, and I have a few copies of this one, plus the original. You can have this one. Danke, I'll certainly play it much. Ignaz smiled. Felix's mouth nearly dropped. This was nothing like Selter. He must have really liked Ignaz. Selter then told Felix, You must go to the auditorium. Rehearsals start in fifteen minutes. He gently nudged him out of his office. Felix huffed and listened. Rehearsals with the choir went fairly normal. Ignaz watched from one of the seats. The orchestra wasn't with them today. So Felix couldn't tell Reitz about Zelter letting Ignaz keep a copy of a Bach manuscript. Sitting beside Felix were his two friends. The one on his left was named Edward de Bryant. He was an excellent singer. The other one on his right was Carl Klingman, who was also a great singer and a poet. Both were near Felix's age. As Zelter had the women practice their section, Felix began whispering to them. Both Edward and Carl were surprised at Zelter. They murmured and giggled a bit upon the subject. Felix suddenly felt a light slap on his shoulder. He turned around, and one of the older gentlemen in the choir gestured him to shut up. Felix turned back and kept quiet for the rest of the rehearsal. When the choir rehearsal ended after two hours, Ignaz accompanied Felix back to his home, where they were to join for tea. Ignaz liked it very much, as it reminded him of his residence in England. Felix noticed he had a particular way of having tea by his manners. It made him very much refined. Leia loved it as well as she tried her best to make tea in the way the English did. After tea, Ignaz left for the evening. 
Upon arriving home, he pondered on Felix's skill at the piano. His instructor had taught him much. Ignaz sat at the piano. He continued on with his work, but his thoughts distracted him. It affected his concentration on the music. He decided to set the piano aside for a while and write in his diary instead to get his thoughts off his mind. He penned a bit about his day and the lesson with Felix, already thinking of inviting him over again before his leave. When he wrote concerning the lesson with him, I am aware I am sitting next to a master, not a pupil. The next week after Ignaz's leave, Felix went in the music room, writing much on a manuscript he had been penning the past week. It was his hand at a first attempt of a full-scale symphony. He worked intensely on it. Much of his inspiration sprouted from Weber's music. He wanted something energetic and grand. Abraham walked in and asked, Son, you have a bit? Wait a minute. He continued writing for a while. Abraham ordered, put the music down. Just a minute. Now, Abraham demanded. Felix immediately set it down. His father explained, I'm taking you to visit my brother Joseph, to show you around the offices at the bank. He is excited to teach you some things. You'll be staying at the bank's residence for a few days. A few days? What about my practice? Felix felt bewildered. Joseph has a decent piano, but you won't be doing a lot of music while you're there. It will be a little break to introduce you into your future profession. Abraham went to his son and patted his shoulder in pride. Felix looked at his father with wide eyes. He was in fear for his future. Abraham told him, We shall leave within the hour, so get packed for a few nights. All right, Felix got up from the piano, taking his score. Abraham warned, Leave the music. It will still be here upon your return. Felix left the music room and went upstairs to go pack. He wasn't happy with any of it. After he got his things together, he rushed back to the music room. He put his score in progress in his book satchel. Right as he closed his bag, Abraham called, Felix, time to go. Felix rushed to the entryway. Before he went out the door with his father, Abraham stopped him. Right away, he opened Felix's bag and grabbed the score. Felix gave a huff. Abraham scolded. You are not going to be working on music while you're there. But father, I cannot let it sit around for days. Put it back now. Maybe I don't want to visit Uncle Joseph, Felix mumbled. His comment was met with a smack. Abraham became heated with frustration. You are going to put that score back in your room, and you are going to Joseph's house. Felix put the score back straight away, his face stung from his father's hand. After setting it at his desk, he and his father finally headed out. The carriage ride was silent all the way to the bank house. When they arrived at the quaint building that served as a home and a business, Joseph welcomed them in. He most eagerly greeted Felix. Abraham warned Joseph discreetly. He's being a bit ignorant. Don't mind being stern with him. Joseph's smile at Felix faded some. Abraham and Joseph both showed Felix around the house. It was a well-suited home with intricate decor to show professionalism. The offices for the bank were on the first floor. A building towards the city center served as the vault, but the main offices were in this home. Abraham worked here often. After Felix settled his things in a guest room, Abraham and Joseph showed him around the main office. It was large and well kept with two large work desks. Abraham explained, I shall leave you here for Joseph to teach you. I'll be back in three days. Listen to your uncle and be a good apprentice. No composing. Apprenticeship? Felix echoed. He didn't like the idea of being called Joseph's apprentice when he didn't want to be in this profession. Abraham patted Felix on the shoulder, then left. Joseph gestured to Felix to sit at one of the desks. He hesitantly obeyed. His uncle assured him, I can already tell you are not fond to learn from me, but you must. He grabbed some papers from the desk's built-in cabinet. Felix listened as Joseph explained every aspect of keeping track of money and to do it with accuracy. Felix sensed his uncle had a deep passion for teaching his nephew the profession. This folder has all of the calculations for this month and what should be in the bank. I'll show you how to make sure that what has been calculated here is correct. 
he opened a folder. Another folder he dug out had all of the expenses. Joseph handed Felix a quill and had him start adding up the totals and checking the numbers. It felt like good-hearted work and something he was capable of. Joseph told him he was already quite good and would be excellent once he trained more often. Yet Felix did not feel satisfied. There was something missing. This was work to make money, keep busy, and move on. It did not feel the desire to create something heartfelt, then later enjoy the result upon completion. It made Felix sigh. Joseph noticed his nephew's absence of enthusiasm. It only made him keep encouraging. You are doing well. You'll love this work once you realize how much it has to offer. It may not seem like it now, but you won't regret taking it up. I know in time you'll like it. After a few hours of basically doing what Felix found out was Abraham's job, Joseph let him off for the day. As soon as he was off, he found the decent piano in the sitting room. He practiced and played. The maids in the house paused their cleaning in the kitchen to clean the sitting room to hear Felix. They were quite happy. Joseph was still at his desk. Upon hearing the beautiful melodies echo through the house, he gave a sigh. In honesty, he hoped his brother wouldn't pressure Felix into doing something he didn't want to do. When the three days at Joseph's house passed, Abraham took Felix home. He asked his son, Did you learn a lot? Yeah, Felix sighed. He wanted to tell his father how much he didn't care for it, but he knew it would only hurt his feelings. Abraham told him, In a few weeks, I'll have you go back to train with him more. I expect that after you complete some university studies later on, you'll then find your new settlement at the bank house. He went on and on about Felix's future. Why can't music be my career? Felix finally pleaded. Abraham eyed him in disappointment. Music is a pastime. You'll have a good wife, and she will have good taste in music just as Fanny, as well as cook and take care of the house. Your job is to provide for her and your future family by having a steady career. Does that not sound nice to you? What about a music teacher? Zelter has a good career. Having that sort of career isn't always practical. You know that Beethoven had not the best reputation, and Mozart was a debtor in real life. Not having a good station that we are fortunate enough to have. The bank will keep your family afloat. Can I do anything creative? Listen to me. Art, music, and poetry are pastimes for a wife to please their husbands not a sustainable career. I am letting you enjoy these things in your youth so you can remember a good childhood. Can I still compose? Felix asked in a somber tone. Only if you agree to continue learning from Joseph and I. Abraham bargained. Felix huffed, knowing he had no choice. He couldn't bear the conversation any longer. He didn't answer to any more demands. Once they arrived home, Felix raced to his room. Straightway, he continued with his symphony that was in progress. During the long winter month of January, Leah's mother, Bella Salomon, came to the home to attend one of the Sunday concerts. Though she lived in the same city, her visits were special. She had excitement upon visiting her grandchildren. Bella quite loved Fanny's talents and admired her as a fine young lady. Fanny was now 18, going on 19 in November. Her newest compositions consisted of the works for piano and leader for Rebecca to sing. Rebecca had become quite a singer within the last few years of music lessons. The 12-year-old's inclination to sing impressed many guests. She also had quite a gift for language and literature. Fluently, she could read the works of Homer in Greek. Paul's interests were devoted to learning the cello. He had grown enough to be able to handle one. The nine-year-old fell completely in love with the instrument. Leah encouraged him to prepare music for their home concert. He practiced some short pieces to his heart's content. In other aspects, Paul had grown and matured into a well-mannered young boy. Bella became very much intrigued as Felix showed her the finished manuscript of his first full symphony. Since an entire orchestra couldn't come to their home, an ensemble of musicians had been invited to play the work. The children enjoyed bonding the day with their grandmother as she had come early in the day. They had tea and lunch together. When evening came, musicians and guests arrived. 
Cheese and wine were served as they visited in the parlor. Within the hour, they then headed to the music room. Everyone settled. Fanny went to the piano along with Rebecca beside it. Though Rebecca was a decent singer, she soaked up the attention. She always had to perform at least three or four a liter. When she finished and she took her bow, she went to an open seat by her mother. Fanny then continued the performance with her newest compositions. All of the guests watched her in awe. She had such grace at the keys that it memorized her audience. Felix wished her talent could fare as Aunt Sarah, but it would remain only within the walls of their home. Abraham listened with the utmost intent. Felix hoped his father would change his mind concerning Fanny. With the grand finish, the music ended. The clapping echoed through the entire house. She bowed humbly and took her seat. Next, little Paul grabbed his cello. It wasn't a full-size cello, but it was a burden for him to drag around. Abraham helped him. Once Paul got set, he began playing some Bach and Clementi minuets that Fanny arranged for him to play. It sounded so pure and innocent. After his finishing applause, the ensemble of musicians got set for Felix's composition. Felix handed out the music for them. The musicians sat and tuned. This miniature orchestra consisted of a string quintet, a horn, and a few wings. Felix stood up on a makeshift conducting pedestal and held up his hands ready to conduct. The musicians raised their instruments ready to play. As soon as the rosin on the bows and breath activated the instruments, the music came to life. The room echoed with melody and excitement. Felix felt the same energy as he had when attending Weber's concert. He had learned much from Weber's way of composition and captivating the listeners. For the next half hour or so, no one would be distracting their ears. The strings jittering through quick passages gave indication to a distinct style. This was Felix's sound. The last movement of the symphony ended with energy. Everyone applauded the work. Felix turned and bowed and courteously moved aside for the musicians to give their bows. After it was all over, the guests began to disassemble for the evening. Bella stayed, of course. She was so enthralled by the concert. She felt proud to have such talented grandchildren. Later that evening, as Felix wandered the house, Bella called him to the parlor where she sat in her lonesome. Most of the guests had made their leave. The remaining ones were back in the music room as Fanny and the rest of the family played some casual music for the evening. Bella gestured to Felix to sit in a chair beside her. Once he sat, she grabbed a bag beside her and took something out. It looked like a book of papers bound together. Felix's eyes brightened as he noticed that it was a score. Bella told him, I mean to give you this. Your aunt Sarah, my sister, wanted you to have it as well. It's a copyist score of an old orchestra piece. She handed it to Felix. He looked at the front. Right away his excitement flared. It was an orchestra piece by Johann Sebastian Bach. He looked at the title, St. Matthew Passion. Felix guessed that it was an old church piece. Most professional music in Bach's time was church music. Since the time of Mozart and Beethoven, music started to become freelance. Bella explained, This piece has not been performed since the time of Bach. Really? Felix stared at it in awe. Bach had died in 1750, so this piece had not been performed in almost a hundred years. Felix began to recall upon examining the music that Zelter had this piece in the Sing Academy's collection. He attempted to get it performed. Sadly, it didn't turn out due to the complexity. Bella then told him, It took a while to convince Selter to lend the manuscript to get it copied. Edward, your violin teacher, and his younger brother, Julius, did the work of copying it. Don't go Shane. Felix couldn't wipe the smile from his face. He headed to his room with his gift, sitting at his desk. He examined it front and back, analyzing each section. He began to wonder, is it possible to make a more playable arrangement? That next year, in 1825, Abraham set out on another business trip to Paris, this time taking only Felix. Felix received a letter of invitation to the conservatory in the city from one of the most highly rated musicians in Europe. His name was Luigi Cherubini, a composer of opera. Upon learning about the young Berliner, he wanted to meet the Bowie. 
Since Abraham had work, it was practical for them to journey there. Abraham hoped to teach Felix about foreign business between his musical engagements. Felix consented to accompany his father and son. As soon as they arrived in Paris, Abraham dropped Felix off at the conservatory. It was quite nerve-wracking. Abraham had to go out on business. Felix had Cherubini's letter with him, so he made his way to the front doors. As he roamed the main entry, he noticed many students and instructors about. Some holding instrument cases, others with canvases and art supplies, as well as many of the ballet department. Some looked his way as he was quite young to be in such a place. He headed towards the music department. Upon roaming the halls, he felt some relief as he gazed upon another near his age. Felix assumed he was a pianist, as his fingers were quite long and well suited for the instrument. Felix stopped him and asked, Can you tell me where I can find Signor Cherubini? Cherubini? What is it you want with him? His accent was not French, rather Germanic. Felix showed the boy his letter. The fair blonde nodded. Go straight down the hall. You'll hear him before entering the room. Merci, Felix said in politeness. The boy then asked, So that letter, your name is Felix. Are you quite a musician as Cherubini must think? I play and compose. I came from Berlin. My father happened to be on business in Paris. About you, though, you don't seem to be from around. My name is Franz. My family came from Hungary. I play the piano. Currently, I am in residence here. He held out his hand. Felix shook it. Well, I guess I should be going. Don't go for the greeting. Felix continued down the corridor. He walked until he heard the faint sound of arguing. It grew louder upon nearing a room. When he reached the door, he opened it slightly. A man stood by the piano, singing an operatic piece for tenor. His voice had the most mature sound that Felix had ever heard. An accompanist played the piano. As the man sang the climax of the piece, a loud voice from another, standing a few paces away, shouted, Stop! Stop! The singer and accompanist both sighed in despair. Felix peeked in more and saw that the one that had yelled. He seemed angered and frustrated. His appearance accompanied his stress. This was Cherubini. He stormed towards the singer. You must control your falsetto. You are trying to impress me. I do not want to hear your power. This is a love song, not a victory piece. Start again. He clapped his hands together. The determined tenor took his stance again and sang with infatuation. Felix thought the singer changed the music's mood. After completing the piece, Cherubini told him, Better. Next time I want it flawless. Now go practice. He pointed to the door. Upon looking towards the door, Cherubini noticed Felix. Felix felt his nerves jump, being intimidated. Yet the maestro's stern demeanor softened. After the singer and accompanist left, he gestured to Felix. Please, come here, young one. I see you accepted my invitation. Felix came in and Luigi told him. Carl Weber told me of you when he passed through here. He gave me the information to contact Spontini. I've heard much of you. I'm taking word from Weber. Spontini rather spoke bluntly. Oh, Felix didn't know what to say. Cherubini guided him to the piano. He opened an orchestra score and told Felix, Play this for me. Felix examined the score as a whole, checking the key and other obvious things. It was a work that rather made sense and phrased well. Most likely it was an opera overture to one of Cherubini's. Felix then put his hands on the keys and read the score, playing it as a piano arrangement. After that, Luigi had him play other various things, as well as Felix's own compositions. When Felix was done, Cherubini nodded. Very well, very well done, young man. Have you had the chance to meet Franz Liszt? He is a very well brought up pianist. I believe he is only a bit younger than you. I suggest you go to one of his performances. He has one tomorrow evening. I saw him in the halls. I'd like to, Felix felt intrigued. Cherubini told him the details. After Felix left Cherubini, Abraham waited for him outside the conservatory. They took a chase back to their place of stay. 
Felix mentioned. Tomorrow Cherubini would like me to accompany him to see a good pianist perform at the conservatory. Oh, good. You may go as long as you accompany me on some business beforehand. All right, Felix sighed. They returned to their lodgings, which was a nice hotel. As it was the evening, Felix and Abraham both retired to bed to get much needed rest. The next morning, they awoke early and got breakfast as the hotel offered it. The food was some of the best. Abraham ate a croissant and pastries with his coffee. Felix wanted something less plain and got a blueberry crepe with a latte. Everything, even the bland foods, were savory. After breakfast, Abraham took Felix to tend to some work. From that point on, Felix's inclination for the city began to decline. He knew his father's work would be boring. It consisted of filling up paperwork at an office building, which was an extension to the family bank. When that was done, Abraham took Felix back to the conservatory. Felix found Cherubini, this time in the same room as before, instructing a group of singers. They were acting out a section of an opera. He raged at them for not being accurate. Much was blamed on the accompanist. The man was breaking a sweat in nervousness. It was only making his playing worse. Finally, Cherubini yelled at him to make his leave. Felix felt bad for the pianist, but his heart thudded as Cherubini demanded, Felix, come here. Felix entered the room without question. Luigi's attitude was quite different with him than yesterday. Cherubini pointed to the clavier. A company. His voice felt like sharp thorns. The only way of escaping these thorns was to do as he wanted. Felix sat at the piano and looked at the music before him. This opera score was far more complicated than the one yesterday. The group of singers stared at Cherubini in disapproval for snapping so harshly at a kid. Cherubini announced, We are starting at measure 37. He counted them in. Felix had no clue what the opera was. He just played what he could make of the score. He wasn't used to pressure of this sort, especially when mentally arranging a rather large, messy score on the spot. He had to pick and choose the main parts to play. At times, Cherubini didn't agree with his arranging and scolded him. The rough session ended eventually to Felix's relief. Many of the singers commended Felix before leaving their rehearsal. They seemed embarrassed upon Cherubini's rage. The tenor that Felix saw the day before explained in a whisper that Luigi had attitude problems. After the singers left, Cherubini told him, France plays within the hour. Fine. Felix spoke bluntly. He refused to say much as his respect for this man was lost. Cherubini sensed it, but rather ignored the boy's attitude. He guided him to where Liszt would be playing. It was a large, elegant room in which piano recitals were held at the conservatory. They took their seats among the already gathered crowd. The young blonde that Felix had met yesterday came and walked to the piano. He noticed Felix and gave a rather cocky nod. Felix smiled back, yet he began to sense that France acknowledged him as to show him up. He wasn't fond of the competitive spirit that was festering in the air. Felix watched as young France sat at the piano with complete etiquette. He then gazed upon the keys of the piano, then the audience. With his arms raised over the keys, his hands barreled to the first chord of his piece. April, 1825. Dear Mr. Mochales, I am writing to give you my experience in my current time in Paris. I am with my father. The city still has its beauty and good food, as I remember, coming in years past. Yet this trip has not fared as pleasurable. I must tell of the concert I attended a few evenings ago concerning a pianist a few years younger than I. His name is Franz Liszt. You wouldn't believe his ability unless you were there. Yet at the same time, it was rather a hash. I wasn't as impressed as Cherubini said I should be. Liszt has much energy and skills that any other boy his age wouldn't. Yet I wasn't fond of his flashy style. It was to show off to his listeners. In short, he has more fingers than brains. His improvisation skills were completely wretched. At the same time, France is a true artist that you couldn't help liking, 
even if you disagree. His compositions I favored not. I guess the only thing he really lacks is originality. I hope to meet you again in the coming time. My father gives his regards, and I to you and Mrs. Mochellis, your friend, Felix M. Felix set down his quill and folded up the letter. He set it aside, then looked to another unopened one that had come to him. It was from Fanny. Felix and Fanny had been writing back and forth through the weeks in their separation. It was rather bantering between their experiences. Felix had written to her upon his growing disappointment in the city. He attended a few other concerts and events that fared bland. Fanny wrote back in response to Felix's negative feelings on Paris. 25th April, 1825 Alas, you both travel to Paris and hear no decent music, or very little, and we stay calm at home and are forced to stretch our ears. This much seems clear. Your talent for fickleness develops brilliantly in Paris. My son, your letters consist nothing but criticism. Oh, the beautiful paintings you've seen. Why no word of them? Nothing on public gardens, the city, the buildings? I feel that the tiresome salon music has killed every ounce of enjoyment for you. She then wrote of her joys in the flowers and gardens back at home. We all crouched around the ground to look for violets, including Klingman, yet he made fun of us. We claimed that he dug up violets. He put on his glasses, then sat on a chopped tree trunk to arrange the flowers and things he had gathered in his handkerchief. Can you picture this grandiose figure? Our garden is already splendid. How beautiful it will be in May when the lilacs are in bloom. Yet you don't even acknowledge the green trees. Have I not mentioned that Klingman has already taken three violin lessons from Reitz? One has to admire his zeal. We think he should become a main pillar in Reitz's symphony society. Reitz has received three students, including our neighbor, little talented Ida Brenda. Her mention of the symphony society referred to what Reitz had been putting together. He had left his position in the Berlin Court Orchestra due to the quarrels and disagreements with Spontini. Reitz decided to make his own Philharmonic Society. Fanny ends her letter, addressing Abraham S.O. Dear Father, I greet you a thousand times over. Farewell. If only we could meet and post on. Fanny. The letter rather irritated Felix. He didn't like how she implied so much on his negative outlook on the trip. In the meantime, he set the letter aside as he had things to tend to. A few days later, he penned in straw reply. 9th May, 1825. I was rather angry over your previous letter and decided to send the sculpting your way. You write to me a preconception of the land where milk and honey flow, as you call this Paris. Are you in Paris or am I? That I must know better than you. Felix. The grumblings of Paris did not stop until his return home.